Good morning uh, to some, good evening to others. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce you to our, our host for today, Vera Tang, who will take us on our journey with Joanne Lanigan. Uh, Vera is an adjunct professor and flow cytometry core manager at the University of Ottawa. Uh, she is a specialist in flow virometry and all things uh, nano flow cytometry. So, Vera? Thanks, John, for the invitation and the introduction. Um, yeah, so I get to introduce Joanne today, our speaker, and I, I feel like she doesn't probably doesn't need very much introduction. And she's a very well known member of the flow cytometry uh, community, and uh, she, you know today she's going to be talking about some of the work with the EV flow cytometry working group, uh, the my flow site EV stuff, and probably a lot of other content, very useful content. Um, she's been working in EV flow since 2012, and she was one of the original members of that EV flow cytometry working group, which came out with the my flow site uh, EV framework. So, without further ado, we have Joanne. Thank you, Vera and John. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending today. Um, I, I know many people are uh, involved in doing uh, EVs by flow cytometry, so hopefully we'll be able to take you through some um, tips and tricks or things to think about so that you can properly uh, interpret your EV data. So I'll start by um, talking about why most people use flow for characterizing EVs. Um, first of all, it's a commonly available technology compared to some other technologies. It's high throughput. We can get many samples uh, through to analyze in a, in, a, in a quick manner and collect large numbers of events for statistical analysis. And it's multi-parametric, meaning we can look at multiple markers as well as some physical characteristics of the EVs using uh, the scatter parameters. Um, another important thing is that we need to think about when using flow cytometry uh, for the measurement of EVs is the level of detection. Uh, we need to establish whatever uh, flow cytometer we're using, what that actual level of detection is, because that's important for us to know when we describe our results. Um, this has been talked about um, before on, during this webinar series when we talked about doing uh, instrument calibrations for determining uh, both fluorescence level of detection and scatter level of detection. And along that same note is standardization. In order for us to be comparing results from one lab to another, we need to be talking in some standardized um, language of, of unit measurements. And so doing these calibrations has also um, allow us or will allow us once everyone starts uh, performing these uh, calibrations to speak the same language. But in the end, what is really important is the interpretation of the data that we generate. And um, in uh, EV flow cytometry, this is really important because EVs are complex. They're uh, difficult to uh, measure. And there are a lot of artifactual things that can uh, enter into our data files that we need to um, suss out. So uh, when the EV flow cytometry working group first uh, gathered, we had this ambitious idea that we were going to um, produce a document of best practices for doing EV photometry. And originally the group was small, about 12 people or so, and we all considered ourselves experts in the field, haha. -ha. And we decided to share some samples and all run them and then compare our notes. And what we quickly realized is that we couldn't even reproduce each other's results. And we were all doing things very differently. Um, how we approached standardization and calibration was different. Um, how we actually uh, diluted our samples was different, what we used for triggering our instruments and so on. So the group decided to back up a bit and um, said before we can establish best practices, we first need to have a good understanding of what everyone is doing. And so we produced this document earlier uh, this year, laying out a framework of the critical components that are important to um, reporting in any flow cytometry manuscript. 
And this will allow us to uh, get a better handle on what we can compare to each other, whether we can reproduce results from one lab to another. And until we establish this uh, mechanism of better uh, reporting, uh, we will continue to have a mixture of information that will be uninterpretable. So you'll see in this framework, um, section number three deals with assay controls. And today we're going to uh, go through these assay controls and describe why each of them is important and how it can help you interpret your data. So what do we need? Lots of controls. And uh, in any environment, we really cannot interpret data without the proper controls. As a previous director of a core facility, the number one thing people came to me with was data and asking for help to interpret their data. And often the biggest problem was they did not have the proper controls for me to be able to interpret their data. And that is why they couldn't interpret their data either. So uh, we're gonna focus on, on the importance of controls, um, not only in EV flow cytometry, but um, particularly across end flow cytometry experiments, but even more so critically with EVs. So the first thing we're gonna talk about are buffer only controls. What's in your buffer? Um, even after uh, filtering of buffers, you're still going to get some uh, scattering of events uh, that will end up in your data file. And generally, if they're very large, like you see here, um, they're going to have a very high um, scatter, uh, and these are easy to gate out. And so generally, the larger particles are not as much of a problem as the smaller particle. And you can see here the fact that we even have bright field images here um, suggest that these are, are fairly large particles. However, um, we recently did some sizing um, uh, across uh, several samples as well as the buffer. And you can see here that the uh, events that are showing up in the buffer are certainly within the size range of what we expect for a lot of our EVs. And so it's really important to uh, establish what is in your buffer because this will contribute to not only your concentration, but your negative population. And so uh, this is why we don't suggest reporting things as a percentage because what you collect from sample to sample, um, the background could be different and could therefore um, contribute to a different denominator for calculating your percentages. So it's really important to, to understand concentration wise what is in your buffer, not only for uh, total EVs, but even for the labeled EVs. So the other important thing is not only uh, what's in your buffer, but what's in your samples. Um, so we have another important control, which is the use of uh, reagents and buffer control with no EVs. What part of your signal is coming from your EVs and what is being contributed to your signal by the reagents only? And so you can see here are some examples where uh, just adding antibody and buffer with no EVs and looking at very low scatter. Um, here, if you're not used to looking at image stream data, these are one micron polystyrene beads here. So looking at things that are um, lower scatter than that, we um, can set a gate and we get this beautiful positive CD235 P population. We look at the images, it looks very nice. Only one problem, there are no EVs in this sample. Likewise, um, many people like to use um, lip, uh, dyes, um, and often these, especially uh, some of the DI dyes, have this tendency to form these micelles and uh, make what looks like nice little EVs. And again, you can see here um, with DIO, we have a very uh, distinct population which looks like uh, EVs. So again, none of these samples uh, presented here have any EVs. So interpreting data, this is where it becomes really important, right? Running your buffer only. Now we have buffer plus a reagent cocktail. And look here, this, the, the patterns are even similar. This was really frightening to me when I saw this um, in, in uh, an experiment where I knew I hadn't added any EVs and, and actually thought it was a mistake and we actually repeated it and it in fact looks this way. And if you look at it, it looks like the exact same pattern as when we added the EVs. 
So again, had you not had this reagent control, you might have made an interpretation of this kind of population that um, was just due to your reagents only. It's really important when you do these type of controls that you make sure that the concentrations of antibodies that you use in your staining match what you put into your buffer only control. Another important control is EVs only. Um, it's important because EVs um, have some basic level of autofluorescence. Generally, it's not a great deal, but it also is important to know what that is uh, for helpful purposes in, in gating when you want to gate on your, on, uh, to see what's positive uh, compared to an unstained EV. But also, um, as we delve into more and more body fluids, uh, we're apt to find some EVs that have a different level of autofluorescence that are not present in other uh, body fluids. And here is an example of some uh, data that was uh, published out of the lab of um, Uta Ehrberger uh, that I've collaborated with at the University of Virginia. And I can tell you when we first saw this, uh, we did a lot of troubleshooting uh, and, and name calling and blaming and finger pointing as to, okay, who contaminated the, the buffer with reagent? Okay, who um, uh, stained the EVs in the unstained control? Uh, What's wrong with this instrument that we're detecting um, EVs in a, at a very high fluorescence background in our originals with no um, uh, staining in the sample? So this took us a really long time to, to unravel, only to find out that um, there apparently is a subpopulation of EVs that has this interesting uh, level of autofluorescence that's excitable by many different lasers. You can see that in this spectral signature down here at the bottom. If you're not used to seeing spectral signatures, across the bottom here are detectors off of each laser. So the Vs are the violet, uh, the Bs are the blue laser, and the R is the red laser. And they usually go up in wavelength across uh, the, the laser. So you know, as they go up higher, uh, across the, the detectors, they, the wavelengths go up. So you can see that what we were seeing here was across multiple lasers and uh, generally in the yellow to orange range. So this is something to reveal and that if we didn't have an EV only, we would may have potentially called this population positive for this particular marker that was in this channel. And so, um, again, it's important to establish what unlabeled EVs look like. Uh, again, here we had to work around this, this population here. You can see here that um, when we have uh, just a buffer only, we don't really see anything there. And these are the EV only in the middle. You can see this huge population of uh, fluorescence in this channel 11, which is generally the channel that we look at uh, APC on an image stream. You can see here versus side scatter. You can also see it here versus another marker. So now we add uh, another marker in here, and we can see that some portion of that population uh, co-expresses one of the urinary markers, uh, uh, podocalyxin. And so we're fairly confident that um, these are EVs that have this red autofluorescence that also express this. But had we not established this, um, we may have uh, misinterpreted some of this data. So again, it's important to understand what the background fluorescence of uh, your, your EVs are. So another staining control are single controls. And I don't think I need to tell this audience much about uh, fluorescence compensation. If you're doing flow cytometry, hopefully you understand this concept. So you do know that if you're using more than one fluorochrome, you have to uh, deal with things like spectral overlap, or if you're using spectral cytometry, you have to deal with individual um, spectrums of fluorochrome so that they properly unmix. So I think most people understand this concept and understand the importance of this uh, in single stain controls. But I'd like to um, suggest to you that these uh, single stain controls are much more valuable in more than just compensation. So think 
about when you're staining your EVs, we have very limited real estate. And if you have uh, epitopes that are very close to each other on the surface of an EV, and you have two antibodies bound to it, we have to start thinking about things like fret and quenching. Because the fluorochromes could have an overlapping um, excitation emission spectra. And when that happens, um, we get uh, unintended fret where uh, you get an exchange of um, emission. So you get excitation of uh, the primary um, fluorochrome. It gets excited. It emits a wavelength that um, subsequently gives off photons that can be absorbed by the second fluorochrome on the marker next door. This can either occur in a um, sense where you're uh, either getting unintended fluorescence or an enhancement of fluorescence by the acceptor molecule, or you could um, potentially um, be losing or quenching some of the light from uh, the primary marker and it no longer being uh, detectable or being detected at a lower wavelength. So to give you some examples of how this may happen, this was a panel uh, that we uh, did with the uh, urinary EVs uh, with the Irvirga lab. And you can see the different fluorochromes and the excitation and emissions that they have here. And so look at this uh, emission spectra here. Um, when you look at the Alexa 405 here, you can see that um, the uh, emission, which is in the, the uh, uh, graphic and the dotted lines are the absorption um, uh, spectra of the other fluorochromes. You can see that there is some overlap there where some of the emission from the Alexa 405 could potentially be um, absorbed by the other fluorochromes if they're in prox close proximity. And so by looking at a single stain um, uh, versus a multi stain sample, you can assess whether there's any kind of interaction going on with your fluorochromes um, if you see a change in fluorescent intensity from a single stain to a multi-stain sample. And actually, uh, the more I look at this, the more often um, I see this type of phenomena. So the level of quenching that occurs is going to depend on the proximity of the markers, the fluorochromes in use, and of course, the density of the epitopes that are being labeled. This is another example. Uh, this time we're looking at FITSI. Here you can see the um, emission of FITSI can be absorbed very nicely by uh, the PE uh, and to some extent by the uh, Alexa 594. Um, and so again, when you look at uh, the single versus uh, multi-stain, you can see that we have a, a difference um, not only in intensity, but in frequency um, of events as well. So we may be losing some of the uh, fluorescence on the dimmer ones completely and only detecting some of the brighter labeled uh, or higher density epitope EVs. And again, going through each of these fluorochromes, you can see here, in this case, we have PE. You can see that the emission of PE is nicely absorbed by um, the uh, Alexa 4 594 fluorochrome. And again, uh, we see, uh, again, some uh, diminishing um, effect, but not quite to the same extent of, as some of the others that were demonstrated. And then finally, if you look at um, the very little bit of overlap uh, between the absorption um, of uh, PE and the um, emission of the Alexa 4594, uh, as expected, there's very uh, little uh, impact on between the single and multi-stain samples. So it's really important to um, establish uh, the differences between the uh, results that you get with a particular marker when you stain with a single stain versus that when you put it in a multiplex. In some cases, you may totally lose, and we've seen this, uh, where you totally lose a signal altogether. You can, you can detect it on the single stain controls, but you put it in a cocktail and um, you um, no longer can see the staining at all. And this often um, can be related to steric hindrance. Uh, if you have uh, epitopes that are very close by to each other and 
you have one antibody that has a higher affinity than another, uh, it could bind fur and potentially block the binding of another epitope that's close by. And so in those cases, uh, you can often uh, completely uh, destroy uh, the detection ability of a particular antibody. So, um, this is a topic that I always hate discussing because it's extremely controversial, but I'm going to discuss it anyway. Um, they, there are uh, groups that feel that this is critical to use and others that don't feel it so important, but I'm going to discuss um, the theory behind it and um, where and when it might be um, important. So, um, again, looking at the structure of an IgG molecule, uh, we know that um, there are uh, several ways that the antibody can bind to its epitope. Um, the intended purpose is, is to bind by the FAB or the antigen recognition portion. But we do know that antibodies have FC receptors and um, potentially uh, there could be some e, um, uh, FC receptors on EVs, especially in the hemopoietic uh, lineage. Um, but we also know that there's a level of specific binding that's just due to stickiness um, and not associated with either of these two mechanisms. So there's certainly reason for concern for being able to prove uh, specificity of staining. But it's important if you want to do this that you follow some important rules. Um, the isotype control, of course, by its name, should be of the same isotype and same species. Of course, should be the same fluorophore and hopefully by the same manufacturer because conjugation protocols can differ from manufacturer to same from a manufacturer to another, and so the levels of number of fluorophores per antibody could be different from manufacturer to manufacturer, as well as the uh, purity of the antibody produced. But the one I think people most often forget is this last one here, which is the, the concentration. You really, your isotype control should be used at the same concentration that um, is used in your uh, antibody staining. And so you can see here that um, what you're looking for is something like this, where you can establish that your specific staining is clear and distinct, and the amount of background that you have from your isotype is minimal, and not something like this, where your isotype control actually gives a better signal than your um, specific antibody. So this is where the value um, that I believe in isotype controls are. So we're going to talk also now about dilution controls. Um, I think now most people are familiar with this graphic um, and understanding that um, in order to establish that you're looking at single EVs, uh, if you dilute your sample, you should get a linear um, response in the concentration or the number of events per second. Um, however, your, um, your staining or your molecules um, uh, or MFI should remain constant across all the dilutions if you're looking at single EVs. So it's really important to establish on your photometer where your area of swarm or coincidence is. If this is an important um, um, test to do to know what range of EVs, uh, of concentration of EVs you can run before you start running into issues of swarm. And here I'm going to show you some um, nice data that uh, uh, came from um, uh, uh, Edwin Vanderpol's group, uh, provided by Britta Betton, who sent some really beautifully labeled uh, EVs. And when we looked at these um, MESF values uh, across uh, dilutions where we were sure there was no swarm, we got nice, consistent um, results um, in, in the MFI. So, uh, is important because you want to be able to establish when you look at different samples that if you're seeing differences in uh, levels of expression between um, different conditions, you want to make sure that it's in fact due to your experimental variables and not due to just the fact that one sample is um, uh, um, more coincident events than another. And you can see that here when we went down to the, the lower dilutions. Um, that the MESF values uh, climbed up, 
Uh, and you can see there are some evidence of dub double positivity that we know is not true um, because it doesn't hold up um, biologically and it also doesn't hold up as you dilute the samples out. So again, it's important to establish a range of concentration that you can um, run your samples at with where you're outside the area of coincidence and you need to um, demonstrate this on your samples with a dilution series. Likewise, um, you may want to interpret your data or your samples as having differences in size, but you have to be careful again here too with coincidence in um, uh, interpreting size because when you're in an area of, of high concentration and coincidence, you can see from these graphics here, the size of the EVs are much larger based on a calibrated instrument compared to when you start to get outside um, the concentration um, of swarm. And you can see as we start going down uh, the concentration, we start to get a plateau of the sample size. So again, in order to properly Oops, sorry. In order to properly um, interpret um, your data from sample to sample, uh, you need to establish that you are outside of um, the coincident area on your instrument. Another important issue is understanding what's in your sample and what types of things can interfere with your EV measurements. Um, again, this is uh, particularly important when we work with different types of body fluids. Here you can see an example in uh, platelet-poor plasma, the types of things that we can um, exude in plasma that not only share um, the um, overlap with size, but also in density. So would, would tend to isolate with EVs. And so we need to establish uh, that we can um, identify uh, whether or not these things are contributing to our analysis or data interpretation. And so generally um, the detergent lysis control is often used in this case um, with the idea that the uh, uh, lipid uh, properties of the EVs uh, will allow them to be uh, lysed in the presence of detergent. Again, you can see at the top here, we have plasma um, derived EVs and, and uh, detergent lysis as well as cultured EVs. And you will notice that uh, when you do these types of controls, um, often you'll find you won't get a complete 100% lysis. Uh, this is not uncommon, but you should be able to see a significant reduction in the number of um, uh, events uh, measured bef before and after detergent lysis. Um, urine is another example here um, in doing detergent lysis and we've found that even within um, a, a particular uh, urinary sample, different types of EVs um, have differential lysing uh, ability with the same type of detergent and concentration. And so we have to uh, take this into consideration uh, when you're doing these types of controls. Not all uh, EVs will um, lyse at the same, with the same detergent at the same concentration or under the same uh, conditions. There was a very nice uh, publication by Edith Boudis, Boudis, uh, uh, Boudis uh, several years ago where they looked at uh, different uh, cell lines, uh, different uh, types of uh, extracellular vesicles uh, based on, on size, um, and they were able to demonstrate uh, differences in the amount of lysis that occurred uh, with um, uh, different amounts of uh, SDS detergent. Uh, between uh, apoptotic bodies, microvesicles, and um, exosomes. And you can see by this final conclusion that um, the amount that was arrived at as being the um, optimal concentration differed by these different cell types. So this is something that um, you're going to have to um, uh, figure out uh, empirically with your particular samples. So uh, finally uh, is uh, experimental uh, or procedural difference uh, controls or procedural controls to determine whether um, your differences are due to experimental or to the actual procedure themselves. And again, you wanna make sure that no artifacts were introduced into the sample during the post-staining process. Um, things like uh, your purification or processing methods during the labeling, centrifuging, 
ultrafiltration, size exclusion, chromatography, et cetera, did not introduce additional um, artifacts. And so typically uh, the type of controls that we use for this are our buffer only or buffer plus reagents and our EV only that have been put through uh, the same um, procedure as our EVs. So the one question, um, of course, is in these lines, um, do I need to run all these controls every experiment? Um, idealistically, yes, it would be nice. Um, but uh, you can see here from the polling of uh, the uh, authors of the manuscript, the, the framework manuscript, um, what the feeling was in terms of uh, how uh, it's necessary to run these controls. Uh, with the blue being in every experiment, uh, the green being in most experiments, and then the yellow being in select or specialized um, applications. And so um, you can see that for the most part, these controls um, are expected um, in the majority of cases, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the cases in, in all or most uh, experiments. So again, you can see that differs from some of the other types of recommendations. Um, and, and so it's important to uh, report them as often as reasonably possible for each and every flow cytometry experiment you perform. So um, that's it in a nutshell. I'd like to thank my collaborators at UVA that I continue to still collaborate with. There's their urinary autofluorescence story is an interesting one. And, Hopefully we'll have more information to share with you on that in some time in the future. And I'd like to thank Josh and Andre and Stefania for um, their persistence in keeping this webinar series going and the work of the EV flow cytometry working group, which has um, been a pleasure. Uh, and you see here my conflict of interest. I am a paid consultant for SciTech Biosciences, the manufacturer of Vora, which was used in some of the data in this presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Looks like we've got quite a few questions on the uh, seminar board. Okay, so the first one that John asks, how did Luca measure size of the particulates in the buffer only control? I think that was your one of your first slides where you had events so in the buffer was, only. Yeah, so um, basically just calibrating the uh, instrument uh, using Josh's FCM, FCM pass software, uh, we just extrapolated that from um, the, uh, the software run for control. Uh, the software actually writes a parameter uh, to the um, FCS file, which is uh, a size in nanometer. Um, it, it, it provides uh, three different um, sizes based on a high, a low, and an average refractive index. Um, so what's reported here is the average refractive index expected for um, an EV. So what's in the buffer uh, is um, size based on uh, the average refractive index. So those events uh, in the buffer that had a similar refractive index. So we have, I'm going to go with a question from John Nolan, which is added on from Josh also. So Joanne, when you present the MESF values, are you presenting the population median, mean, or lower limit of detection? Um, and what I presented here it was the median. And you can see from mm -hmm. that, um, the median um, is, is uh, probably um, the best tool there, but if you, if you did the mean, it probably, the differences would be even worse, right? Because uh, the swarmed events would probably be hopefully more of the outliers and so would have a heavier influence um, on, on uh, value. But um, what I presented was median. And I guess just to add to that, sorry, Vera, um, because John Nolan asked again, do you use the mean or median size estimate when you presented the EV sizes? Again, it's the median. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm going to move on to actually Evan Jellison's question, and it's a, definitely a valid one. People ask about this all the time. Any thoughts on antibody cleanup for both the isotype and the experimental antibodies? So, like methods to get rid of the excess 
things that we can do with cells. Yeah. I mean, you know, we know all of the typical things that are available to us, you know, doing the um, high spins of the antibodies to get rid of aggregates helps somewhat. Um, I still find a lot of antibodies, especially um, certain clones tend to re-aggregate again uh, once you yeah. put them in your sample. Um, adding them as cocktails, I find, you know, I can clean them up and they look really nice in all my single stains. I don't get too much uh, in the way of uh, background uh, reagent in my buffer with the single stains, but once I start adding multiples, then um, uh, there's probably antibody-antibody um, interactions, which cause them to, to aggregate and maybe have increased scatter and therefore uh, trigger more of a signal. So uh, antibody cocktails present the problem. Solutions to these, no, people have done spin columns, but you know, yes, that will clean it up, and but you will lose a great portion of your EVs, and then you have to wonder, am I um, selectively losing EVs in that situation? Size exclusion chromatography, uh, I mean, uh, columns um, or, or is another way some people have uh, cleaned up um, their samples, um, uh, doing density gradients, long spins um, is another method. You know, there, there are methods up there, out there, but each of them have their limitations um, and problems associated with them. Um, so, in my opinion, there's not really a good, easy uh, way. Um, there are ways that you can try, find the one that works uh, best. Sometimes um, identifying different clones uh, or even different manufacturers, um, I find differences in the uh, aggregation of the antibodies. Yeah, I guess it's balancing practicality and uh, good data, right? Logistics. All right, we will go to oh, one that just came in. So Jessica Savelli um, is asking if you find that detergent lysis can introduce its own particulates to the sample. Yes, I, I definitely have seen that. Um, in, a, in a strange phenomenon, is like after lysis, I have uh, this new population that pops up that uh, increases my concentration. So in theory, I guess it could happen. Um, the other thing I always wonder about is when you lyse these EVs that have antibodies on them, you know, what happens to all those antibodies? And I think for the most part, most of the antibodies are, if they're individual enough or, or you know, not aggregated, um, will probably not exceed a, a scatter threshold and you won't see them. But if they're attached to membranes and all start sticking together, um, yes, you could potentially uh, see that as artifact as well. Okay, let's talk. The John has a bunch here about fret. Let's go about fret first. Fret can happen on EVs. Can't it also occur on cells? What is the difference between proximity of antigens on an EV versus a cell? And consequently, have you estimated the antigen density in the cases where you observe fret? So I'll start with the first question. Yes, fret can happen on EVs and cells. It's all about uh, epitope location and antibody uh, binding. Um, so if you're anywhere between 10 and 100 nanometers, you could get fret. And there are actually assays that are designed around this, right? Um, we take advantage of this sometimes to actually uh, look at uh, uh, protein co-localizations and so on. So, uh, yeah, it's not a phenomenon that's unique to UVs by any means. However, I think what John's alluding to is that uh, the surface area of an EV is much smaller. And so the likelihood of having things closer to one another is, is higher. And so it's an even more uh, of a concern here. Um, and as it's also related to epitope density. So if, if a particular marker is uh, a high, on high density on a cell uh, that he was generated from, then you're going to get a proportionate density um, from this, the, the EV. And so that increases the probability. And what was the last question? Um, um, oh, about, yeah, I think you uh, answered it. No, there was one last question that I basically don't have. He asked if I 
oh estimated at the density, density. Yeah. density. Yeah. yeah no ha have not done that yet but that is something that um i think will be valuable especially in those cases where we uh look at um uh losing um uh, binding of an antibody uh and or or a particular signal diminishing uh to be able to determine the epitope densities and i think that would be uh very interesting and valuable yeah, I mean, we've, for the viruses that we've worked with, the 120 nanometer MLV that expresses GFP, we definitely see quenching when you label with an anti-GFP. And I, I suspect that there is also quenching when you're targeting other um, other antigens as well. So this is a particle that's about 120 nanometers. And if you're looking at the GFP, we're thinking about 300 copies on there. So it's quite dense, actually. Um, but it depends on EVs versus viruses. I feel like we have different antigen densities that we deal with, so. Right. All right, back to you, John. Okay, we're gonna take one that I actually see on the chat here. And it's, um, they're asking uh, thoughts on the max number of markers that you can be used uh, when looking at extracellular vesicles. Okay, well, that question requires clarification because you uh, saying how many markers on a single EV um, or how many markers in total. So, if, you know, if, if you don't have co-expression of a marker, that, that is a different question than if you're talking about co-expression on a single EV. In my opinion, you could do doing good. Um, I think three is challenging. I think anything more than that is, is uh, unrealistic expectation. Um, it also depends on whether you're using a um, membrane dye. Uh, you gotta remember, when you're looking uh, binding a fluorophore to a membrane, the intensity is pretty high. There's a lot of that fluorophore there, and it's going to be the dominant uh, fluorescence. And then you adding antibodies with another fluorophore to that membrane. Um, the amount of uh, uh, express, but we've seen uh, large differences when um, we label the EVs without a lipid dye versus uh, EVs with the lipid dye. So that's a situation where um, it's one marker, but you also have a lipid dye. Uh, you could definitely see cases of punching there. I, I guess I, in I, that case, you'll always be going back to your controls to experimentally determine if you can actually do that experiment. <laughs> Well, that's why single stain controls are so important. I find them to be extremely valuable in telling me what's going on in my staining process. And by the way, this is true of, of doing cellular slow cytometry as well. Uh, your single stain controls have a lot of value in them in understanding what's happening in a, a multicolor environment, especially now that we're getting into, you know, 30, 40 markers of fluorescence. Um, we're learning a lot about what can happen uh, with co-expression levels of fluorochromes. Uh, yeah. To add to that, Joanne, how would you feel about applying something like an FMO type of analysis also when moving to, say, three colors, four colors? I mean, to me, the value, I mean, it's a similar um, condition of a single stain, right? You, you, you know, you're, do, you're talking maybe sequential, single stain, two color, three color, right? That's sequential. So that would be helpful in knowing where things are happening, right? So if you have a single stain, you get one level of expression, you add the second um, uh, marker and you still have the same level of expression with the first marker, okay, all good. And now you add uh, a third and all of a sudden things start to change. So that's essentially what you're saying uh, with an FMO, right? It's, it's you're looking at the sequential of, of additional markers. And yes, that, that is important and valuable to do because um, you know it, everything might look fine with one stain, uh, it might look fine with two stains, but maybe once you add that third stain, things start to fall apart. But again, your your gold standard that you're comparing it to is when you just single stain. What what do you get? All right, we have another question from Evan uh, about camelid antibodies. Whether or not there's data out there using camelid or antibody fragments to stain EVs, so smaller antibodies. 
I haven't seen a lot of data out there yet, but um, it, it is interesting. Small, sure. I know when we were um, when I was at UVA, the um, antibody engineering core was actually looking into doing that uh, for us. Um, fortunately, the, the guy who was the expert in that area left, and the project kind of disappeared. But um, anything, I think. You know, it brings up the point that um, we don't have the proper reagents at this point. You know, we're working with reagents that were developed for cells, and for the most part, they work fairly well for cells. And we need some better ways to detect our epitopes uh, than these very large antibodies that we're currently with. So uh, I'm not aware, or I don't uh, know off the top of my head of any studies or data out there using uh, camel antibodies. Some people have used their set out the aptamers, um, which um, are significantly smaller than, than an antibody molecule. So that's another possibility of ways that we can um, reduce uh, the interactions as well. Yeah, and just to echo that, it's it's not actually just the antibodies, it's also the fluorophores that are right, that can exactly. be quite large as well. And I think you nicely so. demonstrated with your, your viruses that not only does it change fluorescence potentially, but it also changes the matter uh, so, and the refractive yeah. index. So, you know, uh, adding antibodies really um, can start to add uh, data to your data that's not the data you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have another question from Edvina Hanser, and she wants to know if there's any way to overcome steric hindrance in multi staining where you have to show that at EVs carry both the markers of interest and saying that you have no other choice of those particular fluorophores. Oh, I mean, if you want to demonstrate that there's not steric hindrance, again, your single stain controls, right? So if you add one antibody by itself and you get good staining, uh, you add it in combination with another antibody and that marker disappears, then it's likely uh, either quenching or, um, um, or steric hindrance. You could test it whether it's uh, quenching or steric hindrance by doing it with an unconjugated antibody on one of them. Um, that will tell you uh, whether or not that that's steric hindrance. Um, sometimes uh, titrating your antibodies can help here. Um, the order in which you add your antibodies. So maybe you can stain um, with one, you know, you can test whether if I stain with one antibody first and then the other second or vice versa, you get um, better staining with both markers. Again, these are all tricks and things that um, have been done with, with cellular flow cytometry. Um, uh, especially with people that are looking at receptors that have, you know, two chains and you're uh, assessing each of those chains with a different antibody. Those have often created problems with things like uh, steric hindrance. I think uh, if you've done any work with chemokine receptors, uh, this is another challenge. And even in cellular flow cytometry, um, that you sometimes have to change the order of the staining in order to be able to see one over another. So um, again, take your cellular world, think about the kind of things that um, develop uh, to uh, enhance uh, staining in a multicolor environment there, and they should apply fairly well here. Uh, okay, one last question. This one is a poured over from Charlene Mao. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Could you provide more information regarding the instrumentation? I saw data from ImageStream and Aurora. Is any other <laughs> instrument involved? Thank you. Um, since that, the, the experience, most of my experience with uh, EV flow cytometry has been with those two instruments. Um, that's the data that I showed there. So, um, but there are plenty of other instruments out there that you can run EVs on. Um, it doesn't change any of the recommendations. Um, it, it may change what you see or don't see uh, in terms of uh, limits of detection. So um, that's one of the things that you do have to establish uh, and it is important uh, as well as uh, sensitivity levels and determining how many MESF um, uh, molecules you can you can actually detect. So and and swarming. Swarming is going to vary um, based on the instrument as well. Uh, the Aurora has a very um, narrow uh, laser beam height, so um, it, it's 
doesn't swarm as bad as some other cytometers that I see that have a very um, a much wider beam height where you can fit more EVs in the laser beam simultaneously. Um, the image stream, we have images, so it's, it's very helpful to um, be able to identify when you're in a swarming, you'll see it. Um, you'll see images that have multiple particles in them. And it's not that it doesn't occur, um, but um, it, you, it's more obvious, I think, on an image stream. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, if you, you know what Joanne was saying about using different instruments, calibration is really important. Depending on you know that that is what allow will allow you to use pretty much any instrument, and as long as you report it in standard units, then we should be good. You shouldn't be surprised that after calibration, um, that or, or using different instruments, you might see different things. Um, I can. I can tell you that I've seen biases on instruments depending on their level of detection sensitivity. Um, you're still uh, looking at this autofluorescence population. Um, it's a much higher frequency of the image stream than it is on the aurora. And I think it's because the image stream is tending to bias the data more toward the larger particles because if they're not labeled, um, in order to initiate an event on the image stream, it has to have enough scatter. So um, I think here that uh, the, the, the EVs that don't um, have fluorescence or um, a high enough scatter are not being seen on the image stream. So that is biasing the data to um, the autofluorescent and higher scattered um, uh, EVs. So um, you will see different populations depending on your level of detection sensitivity. And I think by that, you just answered one of John's other comments about limit of detection and sensitivity. <laughs> I think that's a wrap. Yeah, sorry, Joanne, go ahead. No, I just wanted to thank everybody for attending and, and to think about experiments carefully uh, before doing them. And once you have the data, when you decide to interpret your data, think carefully. So yeah, just a quick reminder that the discussion can continue on Slack. So if you guys have any questions after stewing on it a bit and thinking about it, then please do message. A lot of people will answer you. Yep, we'll take some time this afternoon to try and answer as many questions as, as I can. Excellent. Right. Once again, Thanks, thank you, Joanne. Joanne. Sure. Thank you, everybody.